Hello, I'm Bibi Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with Merrill candidate, attorney, former city councilor, administrator, prosecutor, and lifelong Albuquerque resident, Pete Dinelli. Pete, it's great to have you here with us in the New Mexico Mercury Library. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I love this place. This is gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Well, the city elections are less than a week away now. Um, we're be, you know, you're behind in the general polls, uh, which has uh, an incumbent ahead. You're a Democrat. You've affirmed your pro-choice. Um, you support marriage equality. You're on record uh, working uh, to hike um, uh, the minimum wage. I'd like to focus this interview, though, on, on uh, five basic things. One, police oversight. Uh, to what you consider uh, the major environmental issue facing the city, the Kirtland Air Force Bill, water conservation, uh, your energized Albuquerque economic plan, and uh, your vision for the next 20 years. Well, before I ask you about, uh, about energized Albuquerque and your economic plans and about, about your vision in the future, I think this is a good time to, to get your, um, your critique of uh, the Barry administration. Uh, what... Um, what has happened to this, to our town uh, during these last four years? <laughs> this question is one of the main reasons why I'm running for mayor. I'm very concerned about the direction my city is going. Uh, have, having been born and raised here, I'm telling you without a doubt, I have a deep love for my community. Uh, and, uh, uh, and my roots in Albuquerque run extremely deep. Uh, I like to point out that my grandfather came to the United States in the year 1900, and he came from Luca, Italy settled in Albuquerque in the year 1900. He was 19 years of old. Albuquerque only was 10,000 people at the time. On my uh, mother's side of the family, she, she was originally from Chacon, New Mexico. And uh, my, I come from a working class family. Uh, my father was a World War II disabled American veteran and a, and a barber by trade. My mother was a, was a, wait, was a waitress. And uh, they met soon after World War II at the Alvarado Hotel. And growing up in Albuquerque, I've seen this city grow. I've seen where we've gone, where we've been, and where we're where we've where we're at now, and where we're going. And um, uh, we're not moving forward. It's like we've been stagnant for four years. We have had a zero percent job growth rate now. We're having a huge brain drain. Our youth are leaving Albuquerque. Kids my son's age are leaving, and they're they're in their twenties uh, because there are no jobs here. And it's like Albuquerque has been rudderless now for four years. Uh, we're not, uh, we, we've had a 0% job growth rate for the last four years. Surrounding communities and surrounding states are doing just fine, but not Albuquerque. We were ranked the fourth worst city in the country when it comes to jobs by Forbes magazine not more than a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we've also been ranked 98th in, jo in job development. The fact is, is that 60% uh, of our graduates from UNM leave uh, that that are born that that are natives that go to UNM leave the state 60 percent that was on channel 7 recently and I'm worried about what's happening in our community I mean how come we're not moving forward and uh, uh, you know that's why I've been proposing uh, my economic development plan this energize Albuquerque we've got to do better than we have been I'd like to see Albuquerque become a destination city in a very real sense by concentrating on uh, on trying to attract new industry to the Albuquerque area. and um, uh, But uh, the goal that I have is to, uh, I'd like to see we become a destination city, but also not use our, our uniqueness. And um, uh, one of the things that I like to, to emphasize is that we need to protect the Bosque as much as we possibly can without any, any of the development that's being proposed by this administration. And uh, I think people are getting concerned about it. but. Uh, 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 I'd like to see Albuquerque again. Uh, really, we have so much to offer. Uh, what a marvelous place to live! Uh, to uh, and I want Albuquerque to provide my kids with the same opportunities that I had growing up. That is uh, a, a good place to live, to raise your family, to get your education, and to give back to your community and enjoy life. And uh, I want to keep our character, but uh, it's like we're we're stagnant. We're not moving forward. We're not. Nothing's. Nothing's happening. And that's what I'm hoping to change with uh, once I become mayor with my uh, economic development plan. So I guess this would be a good time to talk about your energized Albuquerque plan. 
My Energized Albuquerque plan was uh, was compiled over a period of three months where we reached out to uh, financial experts, we reached out to small businessmen, we also reached out to job creators. And um, what I believe is that uh, the first step is to, uh, what I want to do is create a chief administrative officer position within City Hall that would have authority over the planning department, municipal affairs, as well as all the economic development functions of, of city government. And to streamline book government the best we can as far as making sure that it's responsive to the business community with the issuance of permits, for example, or approval of zoning changes, or for that matter, uh, approval of architectural uh, designs. But where in, whenever business is interacting with the government, we have to make sure we streamline it where government does not become an impediment to the business community. So once this position is, is then uh, created, what we want to do is then go back and evaluate what investments are being made in Albuquerque by government itself by looking at the capital improvement program. This is monies that, uh, we, that uh, people vote upon every two years and identify major projects, but do the investment in the infrastructure. Again, uh, the goal is to have no new taxation, but reevaluate the programs that are in place and see how we can immediately invest in our communities. To me, the goal is to invest in our roads, our water, our sewer, uh, our, our also our neighborhoods. Uh, because one of the things that I think that uh, makes a great city a great city is also the walkable city concept, where uh, uh, you want to have neighborhoods where people can uh, live, uh, play, as well as work. And, and again, uh, this, is a new, this is a concept that is on the forefront of uh, development. And one of Albuquerque's greatness uh, is, some of, uh, is its neighborhoods. We have some of the most fantastic neighborhoods, whether it be in the Knob Hill area or the, uh, the central downtown area. And again, the goal would be to invest in our neighborhoods, in our communities. And, uh, and once we start doing this, uh, I'm looking at a $1.5 billion investment in the Albuquerque area over a four to eight year period, because I think this is going to help Albuquerque compete better. When you look at cities like uh, El Paso uh, and what they're doing with their downtown area, or you look at Oklahoma City, or for that matter, you look at Denver, they're making major investments in their, their, their cities, and Albuquerque is having a difficult time to compete. So uh, what my vision would be is to, again, make this major investment. But then we have to expand our economy. The biggest problem I think that Albuquerque has now is that we have too much reliance upon federal monies. We have, and I think that's the way it is with New Mexico. So the goal is to try to expand our economy. And what I want to do is try to go after the growth industries. Uh, there's five major growth industries in New Mexico as well as Albuquerque. The first one being healthcare, for example. Uh, the second one is transportation. Uh, another one is construction. But accommodation and service industry is also a, a major growth industry in New Mexico. It always has been because of the tourism. So what I want to do as mayor is go after a major growth industry. The one that I think where Albuquerque would fit in the, mo the best would be, uh, and this is what the experts say, was probably transportation. What's wrong with trying to attract a major hub, an airline hub, or for ma that matter, a cargo hub or a freight hub mm -hmm. to locate here and try to expand the international airport to make it truly an international airport, but also tied in to the transportation industry, uh, especially, like I said, cargo or, or delivery, have a quick turnaround time and tie it into the railroad. Mm. But this will attract new, this will attract businesses, this will attract uh, uh, new jobs to the Albuquerque area. And uh, the, the goal will be, uh, uh, we won't build a terminal until we get a commitment, but again, to try to attract uh, industry, high tech industry is another one. Healthcare, I think, is probably the most promising one, also, where we could uh, try to uh, have these uh, public private partnerships when you're dealing with research or you're dealing with uh, uh, healthcare in general. And to and it's because of my age group uh, that healthcare is probably the number one reason why we have such a grow, growing industry. And with the advent of Obamacare, that's also going to come into play. But by First of all, investing in ourselves, investing in infrastructure, and then going after major, major uh, 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 industry. Uh, I think the Albuquerque's uh, future will be bright. I need to ask you about um, the considerable heat you've been taking lately about the uh, uh, the Safe City Strike Force and the convenient leaks that have that have been happening. Mm -hmm. What 
appears to be a kind of a smear. I'd also like to talk a little bit about that $1.7 million class action suit briefly. Well, the Safe City Strike Force was uh, a um, organization that I ever saw for a period of eight years. In fact, I'm the one that put it together. And what it was was a group of five department agencies, uh, including the police department, the fire department, the uh, legal department, uh, as well as the fire marshal's office and uh, family community services. And what it was designed to do was to uh, go after nuisance properties in the Albuquerque area and to enforce the nuisance uh, ordinance that was in play. And what the nuisance law was, uh, where real property, whether it be residential or commercial, which is used to facilitate or promote crime, uh, we could go in and get uh, take civil action. And uh, it also involved residential properties. And uh, the strike force, I think, was probably the most effective tool uh, that I've ever seen as far as actually having an impact on crime in the Albuquerque area. We went after crack houses, meth labs, uh, seedy motels along Central, five very problem bars in the Albuquerque area. And uh, part of the strike force was a uh, uh, also included the criminal nuisance abatement unit with the police department. Mm -hmm. And the criminal nuisance abatement unit had uh, uh, at the time between 12 and 16 police officers or detectives assigned to it and they also had code inspectors um, and my responsibility was that to provide legal advice to the group as a whole and we actually uh, would review anywhere between 150 to upwards to 200 properties a week and uh, again uh, we would take uh, uh, what uh, administrative actions uh, go out and issue citations uh, but what happened with this strike force uh, was that uh, you had four detectives that were part of this criminal nuisance abatement unit. Keep in mind, you're t talking about two different groups of people. The first was a strike force that had these five organizations assigned to it. And then you had the criminal nuisance abatement unit and these detectives. And those detectives were assigned uh, uh, to work with the strike force whenever necessary. Uh, and uh, they were actually overseen by a, a captain, a lieutenant, and a sergeant. Uh, what would happen was we had four of those detectives that basically uh, were doing things that were very unprofessional, were taking actions that uh, were not authorized, and uh, quite often uh, what I found out later is that uh, they were not following my instructions, which uh, I wanted administrative search warrants. I wanted them to use uh, actual uh, consents to search and actually get a uh, review of their work. And uh, instead, uh, what they did is they decided to act on their own. Uh, and as a result, they engaged in what I considered highly unprofessional conduct uh, to the point where they had done a, a video uh, of uh, their activity. Uh, I want to make it very clear there's nothing illegal about what they did on the video. Uh, and uh, again, it was clearly unprofessional conduct. Uh, when I found out about it, uh, I just saw a situation where the entire credibility of the union was being placed into jeopardy, and uh, I wanted them fired, along with the inspectors that assisted them. However, the chief said no. Uh, now, I'm going to answer your question regarding the, um, the um, lawsuit. Okay. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, six months after I retired, uh, this administration proceeded to agree to a class action lawsuit. And uh, they also agreed to have me named as a party defendant without telling me. Um, and uh, once that was done, uh, uh, two days before my deposition was to be taken, I got a phone call from the attorney saying, we need to take your deposition tomorrow regarding the strike force. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And I said, and that's when I first learned that this lawsuit had been filed, and it related to uh, uh, these uh, detectives evicting people without proper notification, without proper cause. And uh, these were the very detectives that I wanted to have terminated. So uh, what I think is interesting is that, uh, to me, there was an element of malpractice. Uh, I don't feel that the uh, city attorney's office defended it properly at all. I was ready to go to trial. And uh, uh, the complaint was filed, uh, and, and, and uh, then a, an amended complaint. But uh, 
the reason why I was concerned about this and very, uh, very upset about it is the fact that, again, uh, the conduct of these officers was inappropriate, but what they did is they used this video as leverage in this other lawsuit. And, uh, uh, and again, I was named. Uh, they did not advise me. Uh, first of all, they were, uh, to me, they were required to call me and ask me if, uh, you know, whether or not uh, I was willing to be named party to the def party defend. They should have opposed having me named is what I'm saying. They didn't do that. They just went ahead and agreed to have me named. And then they proceeded to settle it for an outrageous amount of money. Uh, when the judge, uh, in fact, when the judge approved it, the judge himself said that the outcome of this case was it was in serious doubt because of the nature of the case. And again, what you had were uh, drug users or drug enablers or people that were involved with uh, uh, either meth methamphetamine or other narcotics. Their house had been declared substandard because of usage, and the court felt that that was not appropriate. And uh, without even putting on a defense, the city said, well, we're just going to stipulate to damages. And that's what they did. Good. I don't think they should have settled the case. I think they should have. Uh, and the thing is that uh, throughout my career as a prosecutor, as well as a city councilor, I have always advocated for police oversight. I feel very strongly about it. And uh, I think police oversight is a critical, civilian oversight. And uh, what these officers did, basically, uh, like I said, uh, flew in the face of everything I felt I stood for. And uh, that's what I was concerned about. So having been a police reporter for many, many years and having seen many efforts, uh, some of them pretty good, some of them not so pretty good, to, to actually have a civilian oversight structure for the police, I, I'm wondering what, what would you do differently knowing your experience and uh, your long time uh, basically oversight of law enforcement? That's a very good question um, because uh, I've been practicing law for 34 years. 27 and a half of that has been as uh, either a prosecutor or in government. And uh, when I was on the city council, I was the counselor that sponsored uh, the first uh, step towards police oversight. It was the independent review position that I sponsored. Right. I took a lot of flack for it at the time. And I, I have the philosophy that uh, uniforms have to respond to suits, and uh, I, I really believe that there has to be civilian oversight. Uh, and I, I do know that the police department strongly opposed that civilian oversight when I first proposed it. We were able to get it through. But um, I think the civilian oversight process is terribly broken right now. I think that the uh, police review uh, committee or the police oversight to commission as it's in place now needs a major revamping. In particular, I think that uh, the uh, uh, Police Oversight Commission could be empowered with more oversight authority, and oversight authority that is uh, with uh, input on standard operating procedures by police officers, but more importantly, I think also on, uh, on uh, police discipline. I, I think that there would be nothing wrong with uh, uh, you have a situation in place where the internal affairs goes ahead, does the investigation, makes a recommendation to the chief, then the chief makes the decision as to whether to take the uh, disciplinary action or not take it or, for that matter, uh, you know, whatever it is. But submit that to the uh, civilian review board and let them either concur with it or disagree with it, instruct uh, the chief to go back and revisit it, or, for that matter, take no position on it. But uh, I think it's very critical that civilians have authority over the department. And uh, I think the mayor... Uh, I feel very strong about this. Uh, this particular mayor has really put his head in the sand, does not recognize we have a serious problem with the police department. And I think we have a definite culture that we're going to have to address. Uh, and I hope to do that once elected mayor. So as we all know, the guy at the top uh, determines t to a large degree how an operation works. I can remember uh, many years ago the Albuquerque Police Academy was considered top-notch. Uh, it was a value-laden organization. It stressed education. Uh, officers had a much higher, I believe, degree of education than they're required to now. Although, and I strongly support the whole idea of, of having police officers with college education. But um, what 
What does one do to change a culture of a police department? I mean, obviously you have to get rid of the guy at the top. Uh, I would think. Uh, uh, do you also have to completely uh, re redo the deputy structure? And what I'm deeply concerned about is that, uh, and I'm going to address your issue on yeah. the oversight and, and what changes. Four years ago when I was chief public safety officer, I really believe the police department was the best trained, best equipped, best uh, staffed, as well as best funded department in Albuquerque's history. Uh, we had also what I felt was one of the best academies in the country. Four years later, that's not the case. Uh, we had 1,100 police officers four years ago. We're down to 850. Uh, the argument's being made there's 900, but from what I understand, there's 850 officers. Less than half of those officers are in the street patrolling our streets. The training has changed dramatically. And um, what has happened over the last, uh, under this current mayor, we had a series of police officer-involved shootings that uh, uh, involving 28 officer-involved shootings with 17 fatalities. And I think that there's a definite problem within the department. There's a definite culture that I think that has occurred. So what I think needs to be done, and I feel that uh, this Department of Justice investigation is a major black eye in Albuquerque. It's having an effect on uh, bringing business to the Albuquerque area, but also the reputation of Albuquerque is now of that of a violent city, and that's what I'm concerned about. What I think needs to be done with the department is that you have to have a complete reorganization. I believe we need to remove the chief, the deputy chiefs, um, most if not all of the commanders, and have a complete restructuring of the department. Uh, I believe that uh, right now there are 31 uh, specialized units that I think we need to cut probably in half. Some of those units uh, of the 31 do not take calls for service. I think that uh, we have to uh, uh, put it in place where the captains, lieutenants, and even sergeants take calls for service. But I think we also have to take a look at the training that's going on. Um, and I've struggled with this issue for a while. I mean, why had we had so many police officer involved shootings? And I've reached out to try to talk to a number of cops and uh, commanders. And I think what happened was in, uh, I believe it was the year 2005, there was a major event that occurred that had a dramatic effect on, it, on police in Albuquerque. Uh, and that was when uh, John Hyde killed two police officers and uh, killed three civilians. Yeah. Six months later, you had McGrain who was killed, the, 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 the SO. And I think that that event, those two events uh, happening so close, there was a major shift in focus. And I think what happened was is that, uh, and again, I've struggled with this, I think there was a major shift in focus with the training involved. Up until that point, there was a concern about having um, community-based policing where you had officers that were reaching out to the community. But all of a sudden, because of these killings, I think that uh, there was an emphasis placed on uh, officer training and uh, self-defense. Uh, and I also think that what happened was the training at the academy changed dramatically. So uh, I think that you had a definite cultural shift within the department, uh, and uh, that's what's happened. I think what happened uh, during the last four years, it came to a culmination where we went from this community-based policing with strong emphasis placed on uh, officer safety, and I think that was reflected in the training. Uh, question is, was a, did we recruit a more aggressive officer? I'm not sure, but I think the training had a lot to do with it, where uh, whenever, especially with the, with the, uh, uh, with the mentally ill, uh, when you take a look at these officer-involved shootings, uh, there's a large percentage of them involved in mentally ill. And instead of trying to, uh, I think the officers were reacting the way they were trained. And that's what uh, I think that we need to address. But there's a definite culture there that I think I, I think we need to change it, turn it around. Well, the police issue is is a dominant issue in my mind, but water is also a dominant issue. I know that you um, that you feel very strongly about the Colonel Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, we have heard very very little from the current administration, or from anybody actually, about that, you know, other than other than the Air Force, which says we own it, uh, and they do own it because they caused it. Uh, this is probably the largest spill in the country, uh, from what I can tell. What uh, would you do uh, to spur the Air Force into cleaning up that awful mess, which may have an impact on as much as 
20 percent of our groundwater i've tried to keep up with this issue and in fact uh, uh, uh have gone to some briefing sessions i think this is the number one this kirtland air force spill is the number one environmental problem facing albuquerque today uh, there's conflicting reports. Um, some reports say that it is not affecting the groundwater. The others say that it is, that it's actually gotten into a, tr a tributary, underground tributary, where the, it's leaking into that and it's uh, going downstream. Uh, I think this mayor and this administration has been asleep at the wheel. They have not uh, worked very closely with the congressional delegation. Uh, I would not hesitate at all. Uh, and you're looking at a trial lawyer, so... <laughs> I wouldn't hesitate at all to instruct the city attorney's office to dedicate uh, a good portion of their resources to uh, get involved with an intervention action to force the, the federal government to clean it up. They're not moving fast enough, uh, and that's what I'm worried about. And uh, you, you keep hearing the PR spin that's being given on by the Air Force, but the fact is our congressional delegation needs to be far more aggressive, far more assertive. And I think the city needs to partner with the congressional delegation far more than they have been. But I, I don't think the city really has a choice. I think we need to get involved with that litigation as quickly as possible and push push as hard as we can. Uh, and uh, if, if they don't clean it up soon, I'm concerned that it is going to have a major impact on the Southeast Heights. So if one is living uh, through what probably is a, a climate change-induced drought, which may go on for a very long time. Um, and if uh, one does have a major and many other uh, uh, contaminant problems uh, with the aquifer, what kind of emphasis would a mayor who was rational place on uh, water conservation in this town? And how do you, how do you um, uh, uh, tie water conservation to economic growth? That's probably the most complicated question you can ask any candidate for mayor, especially in, in today's day and age. The The fact is is that uh, what we have is uh, uh, we thought that we all of our water problems were going to be solved with the San Juan Division Project. Right. But now that the, we have the drought that is uh, basically wrecking havoc on Albuquerque and, as, and the surrounding economies, uh, we're going to have to be far more assertive as a city on the water conservation effort. Uh, I believe that uh, the city, uh, and by the way, I, I think I have a, a uh, uh, I'm the only candidate that's been endorsed by the Sierra Club, and I think it's because of my commitment to the environment. Uh, when I was on the city council, I was involved with the auto emissions program, and we, we put that in place. But I also was a sponsor of the, uh, the development of the groundwater, uh, comprehensive groundwater protection policy and the drilling of the of the uh, of the uh, the groundwater monitoring walls throughout the Albuquerque area. But uh, I think that City Hall uh, needs to promote and push very hard water conservation efforts, especially within the government facilities, also relating to our parks as well as our, our uh, golf courses. I think uh, Albuquerque is one of the largest users of, of water, and we have to cut, curtail that. Uh, I think we need to also implement, uh, there, we do have some voluntary measures, but uh, I think we're at the point where if we don't take far more aggressive action in reducing our use, uh, I think that uh, it's going to continue to be a major problem. Uh, we have to avoid attracting industry that has high water usage. I mean, the days of attracting industry like Intel are over. Uh, we're going to have to be looking at other industry that has very little, if any, water use uh, associated with it. And, uh, for example, the film industry is probably the most exciting one yeah. that I think that uh, we could tap into. But the overall approach I think city government needs to do is be a lot more assertive in implementing and, uh, and, and enforcing uh, groundwater uh, conservation efforts and uh, low-flow toilets, for example, and little things that we could do as a city, especially in our government uh, facilities, to reduce our use. And... Uh, that's something that, uh, that as mayor, I'd, w I'd want to make it uh, part of, uh, of a plan. You know, four years ago, Albuquerque was at the forefront of green initiatives. Right. And uh, we, in fact, in imp implemented the green building codes. Uh, this mayor has, when he took office, he started setting all that aside. And uh, I'm not sure that this administration is all committed to the, to the environment and trying to do water reduction as well as... Uh, other uh, environmentally, uh, uh, the environmental approach to, to, to codes. Well, obviously there is there are dozens and dozens of things we could talk about today, but we're beginning to run out of time. So uh, 
I'd like you to sort of wrap up uh, your view of the future for us. Um, what, uh, what can Albuquerque become, uh, given uh, major climate issues, uh, major drought issues associated with climate change, and with uh, the state of national politics, by uh, partisanship of, of an almost insane nature, what can we actually, what's the future look like? Well, Albuquerque to me is one of the greatest places in the world to live. I mean, having been born and raised here and, and seeing it grow and develop, our potential, I think, is uh, incredible. And uh, we have to have enough confidence in ourselves and our abilities as a community uh, to making sure that uh, we try to uh, expand our economy, but to also being very sensitive to the environment, to try to attract new industry that will provide jobs and jobs with a real future. I don't want Albuquerque to be a minimum wage city. I mean, there's nothing wrong with minimum wage, don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, coming from a, the son of a waitress who supported a family of four on the minimum wage, I know the importance of those jobs. But I also know that uh, Albuquerque's best days are yet to come. And if we uh, think smart, we invest in ourselves, we attract industry that uh, will help our economy expand to get off the federal, uh, the federal government dole uh, and uh, try to attract new industry to the Albuquerque area, invest in our education system more than we have been. Uh, to me, the education system is something that is very critical. Uh, I feel that uh, uh, the particular uh, present administration, the mayor, has not advocated enough for our school system, and I totally disagree with the approach that our governor has taken. But uh, education has to, be, has to be a key component to being able to attract new industry to the Albuquerque area. And we also have to get a handle on the police department. I mean, so it's a combination of, of many things that I think that uh, the goal is to take Albuquerque, its greatness, its uh, those things that make Albuquerque, Albuquerque, expand on them, but uh, invest in ourselves and have enough confidence in ourselves to, to look forward and not to be afraid of the future and prepare ourselves for, for, uh, for, the, for a new global economy. Well, thank you, Pete. I appreciate your, uh, your candor and... Uh and your expansiveness, and uh, it's been great having you here with us. Thank you for having me, and I, I've always enjoyed talking to you. It's uh, You're an incredible uh, individual, and I've always enjoyed your friendship. Thank you.